the Pacers couldn't stop making threes, and the Knicks got blown out of the water late in their loss, 132-121 to 121 to the Pacers. But there were some good things still with Jalen Brunson, Carl Anthony Towns, OG Ananobi, and more, despite the fact that the Pacers went nuts. More on that right now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks. Your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is sponsored by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. And your favorite podcast now has a newsletter. So introducing the Locked On Knicks Daily Newsletter. It's your one stop for ultimate team and league coverage delivered right to your inbox. Sign up for free now at LockedOnDaily.com. That's LockedOnDaily.com. And start your day with the all new free Locked On Knicks Newsletter. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. Whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking insights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode. I'm Alex Wolf, I'm in chief and Nick Sight, the Strickland, which you can find at the Strick.land. And today I am getting into a 132 to 121 Sunday. It wasn't really a matinee, but Sunday earlier than usual evening game for the Knicks versus the Pacers. I guess it was probably what four. Eh? No, I think Indianapolis is on Eastern time. It's right on the cusp there. I always forget. But either way, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, a little bit of an earlier tip off than usual. And uh, I don't know. The Knicks looked uh, they looked pretty good on offense. And on defense, I honestly did not think they looked the worst. This felt sort of similar to the, the Celtics game where it was just like the Pacers just couldn't miss from three at a certain point. And some nights against teams in the NBA, that's, you know, you're going to just have to deal with that. I do think that the Knicks still need to address getting better at preventing teams from getting in a position to get so hot from three. I think they need to figure out what their perimeter defense is going to look like that isn't essentially just, you know, hey, OG and Mikhail will will smother the two, you know, best ball handlers on the other team. And then we'll just hope that we can force turnovers or whatever, because some nights you're just not going to force those turnovers. And the, the Knicks are seem especially susceptible to swing sequences that end up with the ball in the corner. Like they don't seem to have much of a a plan for that and that led to a bunch of open threes in this game uh particularly for miles turner a couple for pascal siakam and um just other players on the the pacers as well it just was not was not a the greatest game of preventing three pointers from the knicks here uh but let's just dive into the numbers a little bit i just in case anyone is thinking the sky is falling today uh the pacers shot 21 of 46 from three overall in this game which is pretty absurd uh, and 8 of 13 from 3 in the fourth quarter. Also just crazy absurd. I know a number of those were open, but even relatively open, teams don't normally shoot 8 of 13 from 3 uh, for a stretch. Miles Turner also himself went 5 of 8 from 3. Uh, I pulled this stat because I was curious. He's made over 5 three-pointers, or 5 or more three-pointers, 11 times in his career. Um, over the course of however many games that is. He's been playing as long as Cat has been playing because they got drafted the same year in 2015. So do the math, almost 10 years, uh, you know, and granted he's he's had some injuries and whatever, but still only 11 times in his career has he made over five threes. In case you're curious, three of those have come against the Knicks and two of them within the last 12 months. So I think going into every season now, we kind of just have to assume that one of the meetings between the Knicks and the Pacers Miles Turner is going to hit five or more threes and completely swing the outcome of a game because I think that's ultimately what happened in this one. I know the guys, he's shooting 41% from three to start this year, but he's usually by the time the dust settles by the end of the season, he's somewhere between a 33 and 37% three point shooter, but he's only done 37 once in his career. Usually he's more like 33 to 35% from three. So, you know. This is just one of those outlier games, I think, for him. Um, you know, he has a few of these per year where he gets feels a little froggy from three and, you know, makes specifically the Knicks pay most of the time. Uh, three out of 11 times, again, in his career that he's had five or more three-pointers, he's done it against the Knicks. So 
Uh, then you had Benedict Matherin setting a career high with 38 points. Again, that, that was sort of reminiscent to like Jason Tatum in, in game one where he just he went unconscious at a certain point and just could not miss. Um, and then Tyrese Halliburton got back on track with 35 points, 11 of 18 shooting, found his three-pointer a bit, shot four of 10 from three. So, you know, these are things that that are going to happen sometimes. You know, a, a team will just get hot. It, it would have been nice, though, if the Knicks had been a little better on defense. Um, you know, I think that they, again, are not doing a good enough job deterring teams from shooting on the perimeter. Um, that said, I do think that they – did okay enough uh, defending the interior in this game. And, you know, I think that despite the numbers, uh, which I'll get into in a minute, I thought the cat had one of his better defensive games in this one, um, at least to my eye, at least as far as like an individual defensive effort is concerned. That said, like the Knicks did give up a few too many offensive rebounds and second chances, which you don't love to see. Um, you know, I, I wish they would have boxed out a little better. You know, there's just, there's a lot of things that kind of, you know, a lot of straws that broke the camel's back in this one. But I think the main one was just that, you know, even when they started contesting somewhat well on the perimeter, the Pacers were just so hot from three that it made it made it difficult to put this one away. Um, but I thought there were some good things to look at on offense. Jalen Brunson, for example, 33 points, 10 assists, six boards, 11 to 17 from the field, one to two from three. Uh, I thought it was maybe his best offensive showing of the year so far. Uh, at least on the overall, you know, I think that he's, I, I think there are some games that I found slightly more aesthetically pleasing from a scoring perspective, but just as far as like the, you know, getting a double, double, the assists were looking really good. I thought this passing was great. I thought this was like his most floor generally kind of game of the year so far. Um, I think the passing probably stood out the most to me, uh, like as last few games, I think it's cool seeing, how much his processing is improving right now um, in terms of, you know, what he's looking to do when he drives into the paint. Um, you know, it's not as much just looking for a shot right now. It's like going through a couple couple progressions, almost like a quarterback and, you know, looking for guys on the perimeter, looking for cutters, you know, seeing what options are out there, uh, especially with Cat, you know, uh, keeping up with where Cat is and if he can generate an opportunity for him. Uh, I, I think it's really been good. Uh, I think the pick and pop with Towns took a a bit of a uh, jump forward in this game. Uh, you know, the last game I was I was remarking too about how I wish they had done a little more pick and pop um, instead of just the pick and roll. And they worked in one really good one in this game. And I think that it was sort of, you know, a, hopefully a blueprint of something that they look back on in tape and say, hey, th we need to do this more often because they, you know, Miles Turner is a pretty darn good defensive center, like. I think really, you know, was was keying in on Cat and trying to make his life uncomfortable. But Cat, I think, did a really good job against him. But, you know, Turner, at, you know, on this possession, I'm thinking of like it was just a simple, you know, pick and pop. Like Cat just came over, set a screen for Brunson on the left side. Brunson took the screen instead of rejecting it. Like he re he rejects the screen, I think maybe a little too much, um, but it was a good solid screen. And that got Brunson over it. And then, you know, TJ McConnell eventually got around cat and followed, but miles Turner had already like fully committed to trying to stop Brunson. And he faked a little bit like he was going to go inside and then just kicked it out to cat wide open three. Um, you know, that that's the sort of possession. I think the Knicks should make one of their bread and butters this year. You know, I think you want to get cat in this game. He shot five, three pointers. I think you want to start getting cat like seven or eight, three pointers a game. And that's a good way to get him that diet, you know, just, keep running that pick and pop like keep trying to distract the defense because then the thing is if that center doesn't do enough to try to contain Jalen Brunson then you're in a position where Brunson just kind of walks right into the hoop because who else is going to stop him at that point you know if he has a head of steam and the center doesn't shade over well enough he's probably looking at a foul or a tilted defense or whatever and you know maybe that results in another opportunity for someone in the corner like Mikhail and OG have been pretty consistently in the corners as the Knicks have been kind of uh, sticking to the, the horns look a lot. So, you know, there's a lot of options there. If you just start using that basic uh, pick and roll with Brunson or pick and roll, pick and pop with Brunson and cat where cat tries to pop out more often. Um, I think that'd be really beneficial to them if they keep doing that. 
but it also seems like he's more actively looking to kick out when he drives too. Brunson, that is. Found a cutting heart and a cutting deuce in this one for some pretty nice makes that way. Um, you know, I think that he's sort of getting a bit of Julius Randle to him in that way where he's driving and and then, you know, even if he like stops, he's kind of assessing the floor, starting to understand where people are going to be and, you know, looking for cuts and looking to pass out of doubles. And so I thought he did a good job of that in this game too. Um, scoring wise, I think it was about what you would expect, but I, I wish that he was looking for threes more. Uh, like he had Turner switched on him a few times and didn't take advantage of that with three pointers every time, you know, the one time he, I think he could have, you know, just gone for a three on him, just kind of uh, made a fake. Like he was going to go inside, gotten Turner tilted a little bit, taken a step back and shot a three from there. And like, he only took two of them, but he made 50% and he made one of two. So it seemed like the three was falling today, but instead he, he seemed a little more determined to get to the rim in this one, which fine, but like the Knicks just weren't getting, volume three-point shooting anywhere else in this game and so i think it sort of falls on jalen to do that himself in that case um granted he just wrecked ben shepherd and tj mcconnell in this game too every time that they were on him and he got inside he, he they couldn't do anything i mean they were just on roller skates every time that he got inside so can't totally blame him he was cooking in that respect um but i hope going forward he starts prioritizing the three a little more especially if it seems like it's a day where it's going to be falling. You know, I know he's had some on and off, a little bit of an on and off relationship with the three-pointer so far this year, but hopefully he's able to figure that out and, and start getting more of those up soon. Uh, I want to talk about Cat. I want to talk about OG Ananobi. I want to talk about Mikhail Bridges, probably one of his more uh, at least impressive games this year so far. Um, but we'll talk about all that in just a second. But first, I want to let you know about our friends over at FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. And... You know, I I think I told you all to bet on the Knicks against the Pacers. That obviously did not work out well, but I did hit on my weekly Jets hating bet this past week. So uh, I did think it was kind of foolish that the Jets were listed as favorites over the Cardinals on the road, and uh, the Cardinals certainly proved me right. So I don't know. I guess I didn't keep full track, but I know I'm at least 50% on this. Uh I'm going to go back to the Knicks well here and suggest the Knicks minus one against the Sixers uh, at the Sixers game one of the the NBA Cup. Um, the the Sixers just don't look very good right now because they're kind of the walking wounded like Tyrese Maxey is now out for a couple weeks. Um, Joel Embiid, I think, is trying to make his debut in this game, but I don't you know, I, I don't know that I would be trusting Joel Embiid coming into his first game of the season uh, after already injured and everything else. So uh, maybe that's the game to target. That's certainly the game that I'll be targeting. Go for the Knicks there. I think just even just betting money line, like a minus one line is kind of useless to me. So just bet money line, you know, do a little better. I, I, th I think I feel pretty good about the Knicks rebounding well in this one. Um, but anyway, you can get started with 150 bucks in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, maybe that's your first $5 win right there. Uh, that's FanDuel.com if you want to do that. So never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, let's talk about Carl Anthony Towns. So Cat had 30 points, nine boards, one block, 11 of 19 field goals, and two of five from three in this game. Um, so the offense was good. I already kind of mentioned like he and Brunson had the pick and pop work on at least one possession. That was great. Um, he really, he came out and just crushed in the second half. Um, you know, he had 19 of his 30 points in the second half. Um, I think he had like 10 in the third quarter, which was key. Like the Knicks started to look like they were going to run away with it in the third quarter to a degree. Like they were kind of running it up a bit and they got up by double digits. And then the Pacers just, you know, started their three-point barrage that just never stopped um, late in the third quarter and and then all the way through the fourth quarter. But I thought Cat did really good. Like, he he did a little bit of everything scoring-wise. I thought 
he was uh, attacking Miles Turner like pretty head on. And Miles Turner is one of the best shot blockers in the NBA, like bar none, like has been for years. So I, I thought that was pretty impressive um, for Cat to just take that bull by the horns and just go right in there and, uh, you know, get, get right after Turner, make a bunch of shots inside, force a bunch of free throws as well. Um, he ended with, I believe, eight free throw attempts in this one, and Brunson had 12. So I, I will say, like, for any faults, you know, that these guys have had recently, I thought that that was, that was a really good job um, to, you know, identify, like, let's get in here, let's try to, you know, generate foul shots and, you know, do that at least. And and Brunson and Cat did a good job of that. Um, but I, I think the thing that impressed me the most, and, you know, maybe this, maybe this is off base, but I, I thought that, you know, because some of the numbers have already started coming out and I'm like, oh, that, that doesn't look very good. But uh, to my eye, I thought this was one of maybe Cat's best defensive games so far this season. Um, I thought that he did a pretty good job other than a couple of possessions where it was kind of, like Clyde uh, did a good job highlighting one late in the game that was kind of boneheaded where I think it was, was it Matherin that was driving? Someone had like a pretty clear lane to the hoop and Cat sort of had this opportunity of like, okay, I could try going straight up or I can, you know, foul the guy or whatever, like make this a little harder on him. And instead he just sort of like never really committed to anything and was sort of running towards the guy and then was running, you know, out of the paint, which he should have just kind of stonewalled inside the paint but then was running towards the guy and then halfway through decided to bail out. And so like, didn't even really have his hands up anymore. His hands were sort of like, like, you know, at his sides almost, but like up, you know, and, and then just wound up fouling the guy who I think got an and one on that play. It was just, it was not pretty. So, you know, it wasn't perfect from cat, but I did think that early on in this game and, and, and for the most part throughout, like I thought his, his defense was pretty good. Like he didn't get punished on switches too much in this game. I didn't think, uh, or at least certain times he looked pretty admirable against like Tyrus Halliburton, for example. Now, granted, I know that like Halliburton in an ISO situation, a lot of times struggles to turn the corner on guys. So maybe there was just a, a by virtue of that. But I thought he did pretty good when he got into one on one coverage against Halliburton. I thought they did fairly good at, you know, re relocating his way into the paint, even when he was having a guard like Miles Turner. And, you know, it was tough. It, you might want to blame him for Turner going off, but it's, it is pretty tough for, you know, Kat in as of right now to kind of balance, like if you're facing a shooting center on the other side, it, it's tough because, you know, then you have to think, okay, do I stay out here with this center or, you know, I'm kind of the last line of defense on this defense. So I kind of have to make sure that I get down into the paint and, you know, at least get a contest up if someone gets in there. Um, you know, I think that he ran into some of that in this game. So I don't like totally blame him for Turner going off or anything. I think it's just, it, we see the same thing happen. You know, everybody always gets up in arms when like it happens to like Mitchell Robinson with Miles Turner, you know, where like uh, Turner goes off and then everybody's like, oh, Mitch can't defend the perimeter or whatever. It's like, but yeah, you know, this guy only makes this amount of threes like, like once a season in his career. And it's just usually against the Knicks, you know, as far as miles Turner's is miles Turner is concerned. And, you know, so I, I have less of a problem with it. You know, I, I think that it's right to kind of dare the center, even if he's a good shooting center, like a quote, good shooting center, you know, to beat you. Uh, if it's someone that shoots like 35% from three and the, the choice is like, let him take a three or, you know, try to crash in and prevent an easy two or an and one. I, I, think going after the two or the end one is smart you know i think that sometimes it can be frustrating like in a game like this where the next strategy is just to uh defer towards you know letting guys take threes and beat them there but you know it, it it was the wrong team to try it against on this particular night but all in all i i didn't hate his decision making as much i'm sure that some people would agree disagree with me on that um but also i mean maybe i'm a little off base here maybe my eyes were deceiving me grant nba stats um claimed that players shot four or five against cat inside of six feet in this game so maybe i'm off base with him looking a little better protecting the rim but i thought the guys were a little more deterred from the rim so you know it doesn't help that and, and you know he might be getting you know there, there were a few tip-ins in this game so those might be shots that were credited against him and whatever which granted he should just get that rebound period um but you know i I, I, I didn't feel super bad about his game. I guess that's my overall point here um, on defense. I thought that he 
to my eye, it looked like one of his better defensive showings of the season, and the offense was still amazing. So, you know, if he can just get to like average on defense and keep pouring in this amazing offense, I, I think it's going to work out for the Knicks for the most part in the aggregate uh, going forward. So, um, yeah, I don't feel too bad about it. But uh, OG Ananobi really left me with nothing to complain about in this game. Mikael Bridges did leave me with a few things to complain about. Um, I'll give Josh Hart a shout out, shout out, talk about how short the rotation was in this game and how that needs to change soon. So lots more to talk about in just a moment. But first, I got to let you know about our friends over at Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out all the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. And let me tell you, that's been a great feature for me. Right now, uh, I'm planning on going to see some friends and, and their two kids over Thanksgiving. Uh, my wife and I are going to go spend Thanksgiving with them. And me and my friend are going to take his son to his first basketball game uh, in Dallas because they live in Dallas. And we're going to go see the Mavs versus the Knicks down there, which is very exciting. But I don't really know what tickets go for in Dallas. Uh, unfortunately, strikingly similar, at least for this game, to what you might expect to get into the garden uh, for this game. But I've been using game time to kind of monitor ticket prices. I've been checking out the game time, uh, game time picks, which is great. I also always turn in all in pricing so I can see the total of what it's going to cost me per ticket before I even click on it because I don't want to see a bunch of fees show up at the end and game time looks out for you there. So I'll be getting tickets soon. And, you know, if you're ever thinking about getting tickets, game time is a good place to just kind of sit and watch, observe, and eventually find the right tickets for you because they really benefit last minute ticket buyers as well. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N M B A for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. All right, and I'm back in to finish talking through this game. OG Ananobi had a big game once again. Stop me if you've heard this one before. He's he's playing fantastic lately. I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing out of him on both ends of the floor. 25 points for OG in this one. Four boards, two assists, two steals, nine of 14 from the floor, three of four from three. So, I mean, I think he's just breaking out in a huge way on offense right now. Um, the first play that kind of made me raise my eyebrows was he got Tyrese Halliburton isoed on him in the post. And... Uh, OG got the ball and just backed him down like like Shaq style. I mean, it was just like like just got it. It was like you're too little and just backed him in, backed him in, backed him in. Didn't do the two handed thunder dunk like Shaq might have done back in the day, but just made a nice easy layup. You know, after he backed Halliburton down like seven feet uh, in, to right under the hoop and just put that layup in. That was great to see. Um, that was before Halliburton. It kind of started breaking out too. So you you were thinking to yourself, or at least I was thinking to myself, oh, maybe this is going to demoralize Halliburton. It'll shoot O of eight again and score zero points. But no such luck this time. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a great play from OG and something a little different from him. We don't really see him just overpower someone like that all that often. Uh, but it kind of underscores just how strong he is, which showed in this game again. Um, I thought that defensively, like, he took one of the opposition's best players out of the game, um, you know, once again, which he did last game with Giannis and then sometimes even on Dame. And in this one, it was Pascal Siakam. Um, I thought that he just had Siakam in prison in this game. Like, he fronted him perfectly. Like, he was keeping him out of the paint. He was picking his spots, you know, so he didn't didn't make any boneheaded plays to, like, bail Siakam out. Like, it was like, okay, you know, if you, if you manage to get position on me once, fine. I'm going to let you have that layup or whatever. But for the most part, he was really getting after it, like, um, you know, just getting in Siakam's space, contesting his threes really well, which, you know, that was one of the only guys on the Pacers that didn't just have a, a relative ton of easy threes in this one was Siakam because he had the displeasure of having OG on and Obi on him. But in the mid-range game, too, he couldn't get a he, – he likes to get to the mid-range a lot, Siakam does, and couldn't really get a clean look off there. Uh, for the most part, couldn't get a clean lock, look off inside. Um, I thought the OG just did a really good job of of taking the assignment of the other team's best bigger player, like wing or or forward or whatever, and just 
completely shutting him down in this game. Um, the shooting was really impressive from OG too. I mean, three or four from three. It's it's really refreshing to see his motion look so effortless after the whole elbow saga last year. And you know, he's getting his shot off, I think, quicker uh this year too. And you know, sometimes it still looks a little like he really hangs it out there, you know, like when some shooters just kind of like at the end of their motion, like really do the the swan, you know, and like like really get their arm fully extended and all that. He does that to almost a comical degree sometimes on a shot. And it almost looks still like he still has that like little hitch from when his elbow was hurting, but it's going in. So clearly he's found something that works for him and he's getting it off fairly quickly. So uh, who am I to complain? Um, he's he's shooting phenomenal right now. And I think really starting to, to find his groove as a shooter and then, you know, in addition, just still putting the ball on the floor, getting the ball moving. Like, I think he's doing better than I expected he was going to this year. It seems like he's really, and he's he's locked in. He's earning that big contract from over the offseason. So, love to see that from him. A uh, guy who is playing for a new contract and maybe not doing quite as much right now is Mikhail Bridges. Eight points, seven boards, four assists, four of 11 shooting, 0 of 6 from 3 in this game. Um, and look, if... If Mikhail's going to pretty much be a just a three-point shooter, he's going to need to start making them more often. I mean, this game was ugly. Uh, to shoot 0-6 from three was just such a, a death knell to this team. Like, I felt like every time that he got the ball for a three, it was it was at a big juncture, or at least it felt like, oh, if he makes this three, like, they're going to really be cooking. And he just couldn't find the range in this one. And it's starting to – I mean – I don't want to say I'm concerned. I haven't been concerned all year. You know, people were concerned going into the first game of the season. Then he has the bad half against the Celtics and everybody's like, oh, my God, he can't make threes anymore. And this guy's like damn near a 40 percent three point shooter for his career. I know things are going to come around. I know that players slump, but he's going to need more to what he's doing if he's going to, you know, slump from three. I think it's the biggest takeaway here. Like. He doesn't really have a plan B like right now with the way that the Knicks are using him. It's pretty much shoot the three or take a couple dribbles in from the three point line and take a midi. And that's not ideal. I mean, you know, even if he's making that mid range shot at, you know, 45 percent, 50 percent, something like that, which is probably about the number that he's hitting right now. You know, I think it's it's better to get all the way in, get all the way in, try to get free throws, try to get an and one, you know, try to finish around the hoop like. We need to see more of that out of him. And, you know, that, that's been the case with a, a lot or at least develop a floater or something, you know, like just get something where you can get a little closer to the hoop and increase the likelihood that you could potentially get foul shots because that stops the clock, that stops the action. So that way when you're up against a team like the Pacers, you know, that loves to just take the inbound and run with it off of a make. No, now, you know, if you get to the free throw line and generate free throws instead of just making a mid-range two, now you're not giving them the opportunity to run down on you on the other end. You know, everybody's prepared. Everybody gets back right after the free throw and everything resets. You get to, you know, make them face a set defense and hopefully that works out better for you. Um, you know, I just don't think, I don't think that he's putting enough emphasis on trying to get inside. And I know that he's not like, he's not an elite free throw drawer. You know, he he's, I think his best for his, a full season is his, his career was last year, I believe where he, averaged about four per game four free throws attempted per game but you know that's better than one like he's only getting one free throw attempted per game this year and i was honestly even surprised to see that he's clearing a, a single digit at this point i thought that it would be like 0.7 um because he's just not getting to the free throw line that much and he's an 84 percent free throw shooter for his career too like he's only he's sitting at 50 percent from the free throw line right now this year but he's only taken like eight attempts or something like it's not it's not very much. Um, he's not doing very much from there. So, you know, I think that I think he really needs to put an emphasis on getting to the free throw line more, you know, driving and getting all the way inside. And, you know, we're seeing like OG do that, for example, like and they're playing very similar. You know, these two guys like they're both sitting in the corners for the most part when the Knicks, you know, get into their offense. And then if the ball gets out to them, both of them have the same instincts of like, OK, either shoot it or pump fake it, get inside, then start looking for the other guy on the other side. And then maybe they cut and, you know, whatever. But OG makes an effort to get all the way inside and try to finish inside. And he's been drawing free throws from time to time, like more than I think I expected from him. Meanwhile, Mikhail's kind of doing the opposite. So really need to just see more from him because he's down to 32 percent from three on the year. I, I don't think that there's a hitch. I don't think that that number is going to stick. 
Uh, but maybe over the course of the whole season, he only ends up shooting like 35, 36%. And this is like a relative down year for him. If that's going to be the case, you know, he's going to need to figure out some other stuff to make this work on offense because the Knicks gave up a bit too much for him to just be a spot up three point shooter that isn't shooting threes well at the moment. Like he needs to work a little bit more of those tricks of the trade that he learned in Brooklyn and start thinking a little more with that mentality. And it might come down to Tibbs just kind of having him be the guy that works with the bench unit more so that he has more opportunities to kind of work as the the number one scorer. And as of right now, he's been kind of trying to leave one of Cat or Brunson on the floor more often than not with the bench. And I feel like maybe if he switches that mentality and says, okay, let's let's have Mikhail work with the bench, maybe that could fix things. Um, Josh Hart, I'll just give a shout out to 16 points, 10 boards, six assists, one steal, one block. Another really efficient game for him. Uh, not much more to add for me there. He kind of just did Josh Hart things. So keep up the good work, Josh. That's that's all I got to say there. Um, and then a really, really short rotation in this one. It was basically a six-man rotation. Jericho Sims played under 10 minutes. Tyler Kulik played like a minute and a half. Uh, Deuce McBride played close to 30 minutes. So, you know, again, if you're if you're going to play this short of a rotation, you better win the game. You know, like this, this is it's not sustainable. Like I think Tibbs needs to start branching out a little more, you know, maybe start working in Huck Porty again. I thought that he was looking pretty good in some of his minutes. Um, you know, certainly let Kolek cook a little more. I'm sure that if campaign were available for this game, he would have played campaign over 10 minutes. So the fact that he didn't play Kolek that many, is a little baffling. Um, but lots to work on still for the Knicks. Um, and they'll have to turn around and do it in the first game of the NBA Cup against Philly this coming Tuesday, which hopefully should be an easy matchup with the the fact that the Philly is kind of looking like the walking wounded right now. Um, but I think Embiid is targeting trying to come back for that game. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if he makes it back or not. But either way, I, I think the Knicks should have a pretty decent shot in that game. Um, but till next time, we'll talk to you soon. And uh, peace out, everybody.